Welcome to the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast, another CO2 Monday. I want to thank you once again for taking the time to come and learn a little bit each week. We've been doing this every week for over 60 weeks. I've learned so much over the past 60 weeks, to be honest with you, on all the different experts from all around the world coming and sharing their knowledge with us. I want to thank all of them because there's lots of them that come and listen each week, learn a little bit. And this is what Refrigeration Mentor is all about is share and knowledge, really trying to help you grow in refrigeration, not only CO2, but refrigeration in general, because we want you to get better at what you do. If you're a technician, if you're an engineer, if you're a designer, or if you're a business owner, we want to share that knowledge with you. So you can share that with other people. So you feel confident, you feel comfortable talking about commercial refrigeration. This week, I have some great guests, we did a podcast, me and the president of Vitalis, James Seabrook, who is here uh, on CO2 refrigeration versus extraction. I'm going to let them introduce themselves a little bit, but that was a fantastic CO2 Monday. Go and check it out either on the podcast and listen to it or go check the YouTube video because if you can't sometimes visualize what we're talking about, always head to the YouTube channel because I always put these podcasts the CO2 Monday on the YouTube channel so you can visualize some of the things that they are talking about because sometimes they have some great slides. And we also have Parham Islam Najad, who is the CO2 program manager, I believe. Parham's been in talking CO2 for over 10 years and diving into some great details. We had some conversations a few weeks ago on his CO2 knowledge and it just blew me out of the water on some of the things that he was sharing with me. So I'm excited about this conversation today that we're going to be diving into on the CO2 phase diagram. We're going to get into pressure temperature diagrams. We're also going to be talking about purity of CO2. James Parham, welcome to CO2 Monday. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Hi. Parham, why don't you introduce yourself first to everybody? Of course. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Parham Islaminejad. Thank you so much uh, before starting, uh, Trevor, for inviting us. This is an amazing opportunity for me, uh, for me. And always watching some sessions and pretty interesting. I, I, I learned a lot uh, during the, like watching and uh, this, uh, see people discussing about CO2. So yeah, I started doing research on CO2 back in 2011. Uh, almost 12 years ago, and mostly doing research on combining ground source heat pump and CO2 as refrigerant, and then doing a direct expansion ground source heat pump. And also after a couple of years, being a bit comfortable about how CO2 is used and also about the superior thermophysical property of CO2, which is totally different from other refrigerant. We understood that we can also work, use CO2 for as a heat carrier fluid to exchange and transfer heat between different end users. That probably one day we can also talk about that. And now uh, it's been a couple of months I joined uh, Vitalis just to, to be able to do some other exciting projects uh, using CO2 as refrigerant. And this is what it's all about. I'm bringing you the experts. Anyone who's listening out there, this is what you want to have a pen and paper handy because when they, when they talk, they, they've been spending years and years in research. And I'm super excited about this conversation. James, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Apologies for the camera issue. But joining you from Kelowna today, where Vitalis is headquartered in British Columbia. And excited to talk, I guess, continuation almost from our last conversation where pressure, temperature, density, enthalpy, all of those things showing up on one chart talking about CO2 purity, like we were talking about at Atmo. And um, yeah, touch on the, the benefits of using CO2 as a phase transfer fluid as well. Sorry, energy transfer fluid because of phase change. And that's one of the big things that I'm excited to learn about because the more and more I learn about, especially CO2 is, but refrigeration in general, after I, I deal with lots of engineers and designers, is I think about is we're moving energy, you know, where I never ta- thought about that five, six, seven years ago. Now, uh, we, I think a little bit differently, especially when me and Parham had a conversation about when he was talking about ground source heat pumps and how you're transferring that energy from the earth surface into the usable into a system. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. And with CO2, we can do that in three phases effectively. There is a fourth phase, which is solid that we don't see on this chart, but we'll see it on 
a couple of charts later on. And I think this was the one that was much different in our last conversation from a conventional refrigeration chart because in extraction, we're playing with density and we're playing with solubility and we're varying the pressure and temperature of our process, which uses CO2 to dissolve a typical a molecule of interest. The thing I always find really interesting when showing this chart is if we scale this back down uh, even further to the right, and we have it in another chart here, we're only at 200 PSI. So there's a lot of people in the industry that are concerned about CO2 being high pressure. Well, in that liquid uh, overfeed system that we talked about at the end of the last presentation, we're circulating CO2 as a liquid to absorb a large amount of energy. And that's circulating at only under 150 PSI, which is even lower than some of the most high sides of HFC systems. So depending on the application, yes, CO2 can operate at very high pressures um, and really high densities, which means we can move a lot of energy or it can also operate at really low pressures and low temperatures, but still maintain a good density. And that's where I think Parham can explain that when we look at now integrating the enthalpy, we get huge amounts of mass or energy transfer with, with smaller mass transfer than say like water systems for absorbing heat or cooling. Yeah, that's one of the big things about CO2 compared to conventional synthetic refrigerants as well as even other naturals, depending on the naturals, that they have a lot of energy they can, they can move. Can you talk a little bit about that before we dive into this chart, Parham? Yes, of course. The good thing about using uh, refrigerants in general to transfer heat is using the phase change uh, like from liquid to vapor or from vapor to liquid and normally when we do this with water that we have sensible heat when we add or extract heat from from water we change temperature and therefore the units that are connected to those line of like water can operate at different performance with different performance so performance is not going to be maintained however we CO2 at the same temperature, we evaporate and condenses without changing the temperature. And this is going to be the amount of energy that we transfer at that constant temp is going to be higher than like uh, transferring heat using other fluids. For example, for CO2 at 20 degrees, if you imagine you can from vapor, from a liquid to vapor, you have one almost 150 or 60 kilojoule per kilogram of energy. So imagine that you can transfer a huge amount of heat without changing temperature. For example, James, if you go back to the other one, like the one that you had before, it's still pH diagram, and then we can go to PT. This is in Fahrenheit, but at 60 Fahrenheit, for example, at saturated liquid, which is like on the left, all the way to the saturated vapor from left to right below the dome, the difference between enthalpy is at 60 Fahrenheit is some, something around 240 all the way to almost 400 kilojoule per kilogram. So imagine you have one kilogram per second of flow, then this is going to be a great, like a huge uh, amount of energy you transfer. However, like it's going to be almost uh, five to six times uh, more than water if you transfer, like if you have a five degree delta T between inlet and outlet. That's why you can size the pipes is going to be very smaller compared to water or any other refrigerant. And also this is going to happen at constant temperature instead of changing temperature by five or 10 degrees C. So there are, it, it really depends on the application and what you want to do. But the fact that you can transfer this huge amount of energy with its relatively small mass flow, that makes a big difference. Uh, and the pipes, everything is going to be more compact and smaller. And this is what we can use from CO2 as a, as a benefit or advantage to make everything more compact eventually for our systems. Yeah. One thing about this chart that James taught me and, and really is that so that red line in this chart that is at the critical point that would be 87.8 or 31 degrees celsius is that correct that's right so yeah. anything above that 
temperature, but as well as pressure, which I believe is like 1055 PSI or 1071 PSI yeah. a, around that time. That's where you're in that super critical or trans, well, super critical state, correct? That's right. You have to have the pressure, like if you want to say in kilopascal, for example, or megapascal, it's 7.4 megapascal above that pressure and also over 31 degrees C temperature, everything is going to be super critical. But if, for example, the pressure is still higher, but you have lower temperature at below 31, then this is going to be liquid. And again, on the right, if you, if you look at the, the right bottom, then below that critical pressure and on the right of the red line, the solid line, is going to be gas. So it really depends what combination of pressure and temperature you get in your system, then you're going to end up in different phases. And I think that is key because I used to think before, and maybe some people maybe just know better than me, but I used to think if you're above the critical point, like just in temperature, that you're in that super critical zone. But that's not necessarily true because when I was talking with James and he was talking about CO2 extraction, he was telling me, well, we're at 2000 PSI or 3000 PSI, but on liquid phase, because I was thinking, well, we're above there but we're not in that super critical zone. So, or that state, which was something that really was like, wow, okay, I'm learning something here. So you have to have both pressure as well as temperature to be in that state. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we can operate on the extraction system pretty much anywhere within this chart, maybe not up to 200 F theoretically you could. So it's a very, broad range of parameters and you have to account for a lot of different types of heat transfer at high pressures or condensing at high pressures and yeah generally something that's not understood and i wish i had i'll send you a video afterwards that you can maybe upload with it to youtube but it's very interesting to see when you say hold co2 in a sight glass right at the critical pressure and then go below it and everything switches the gas right away or vice versa, drop the temperature and it goes right to liquid because yeah, it, it as a fluid can't exist in those multiple states. It's either a liquid and a vapor or a supercritical fluid, which is pretty cool to see as well. Yeah, and that's something important to really understand that when you get up into that super critical state that there is no pressure temperature relationship, you can now start manipulating the system by moving the pressure up or down and not necessarily change temperature, for example, or some, vice versa. It doesn't mean that for an example, but you can start now changing the system dynamics without changing maybe the pressure or the temperature when you're up in that zone. Is that correct, Parham? Yeah, exactly. So there is no relation, like when you're in below the dome, there is always when you fix one parameter like temperature, there is a pressure assigned to that. So you cannot have different pressure in that temperature. But however, in out of the dome, then this is there is no relation between uh, pressure and temperature. So basically you can have a pressure and you can change temperature. It's, it's gonna, when you add heat or extract heat, it's gonna be mostly sensible heat because you change temp when you add or extract heat from the fluid. But something interesting also in supercritical region is that the relation, it's not only about what we see as temperature and pressure, also when we look at this, like a specific heat of the fluid CO2, for example, close to critical, over critical, but close to that has a, like a non-linear relation between temperature and CP, for example, the, the specific heat, which we have to really be careful about control of a CO2 system. And that's why the optimum pressure control plays a, a significant role in having a good performance for the system. It's true that we have one single phase, but the behavior close to critical region is pretty unique compared to any other refrigerant and we have to always take in that one into consideration for designing our system. 
Could you give an example of what could happen when you're running close to there? Because I think that's important to understand because now you have anomalies happening potentially because it's not non-leader, maybe not anomalies, but there is a different way to look at it when it's running, I'm assuming, in that in those conditions compared to if you're higher up on the, the chart. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we don't have the this curve for CP or H as a function of temp, but you'll see that in a very small temperature difference, you see a big uh, enthalpy difference. For example, like it means that the CP spike in, in some temp temperature, and this is what is called pseudo critical temperature. So it means that like, for example, probably at a specific temp, your enthalpy is a specific number. And then if you add almost just half a degree, you change significantly the enthalpy. It's some sort of phase change happens, but without changing phase. It's just the energy uh, that you, you transfer is quite huge, but you're not technically changing phase from liquid to vapor. The CP spike out for those regions close to critical. That's why, for example, if you try to you run at a specific pressure and you exit at a specific temp out of your heat exchanger and you think that you extract a good amount of energy, but you'll see that you don't change the other media. For example, if you, you exchange with water, there is no temperature, that significant temperature change in the water. It means that you're not transferring enough heat. So that's why it's pretty important to have a, uh, like a good control, to have a good temperature at the outlet of uh, the CO2 system to make sure that you extract enough heat from your CO2. Probably another time we can take a look at the, this change of enthalpy as a function of temperature or CP as a function of temperature. That gives us a good idea what's going on in this region close to critical point. Okay. And when you say CP, just so everyone knows, you mean critical point? No, the CP, I, I mean the specific heat. The specific heat. Okay. So when you say CP is specific heat. Perfect. Yeah. So Trevor, this was the interesting chart, I think, from the previous conversation where in extraction, we have the opposite intent, which is to create a hundred percent vapor during our separation. When we think about a refrigeration cycle and liquid or mixed fluid coming back from the gas cooler, we want a high fraction of liquid going into that receiver so that we can produce good refrigeration effect. But when we're separating ex extracts, we want to reduce the density and increase the velocity in our separator to spin out those molecules. And we talked about hops in the last one. And in our hops extraction, we might be running maybe close to zero Celsius or, or well below. So we're in a very low energy region of the fluid. Say we're up here at about 160 kilojoules per kilogram. Well, to separate, we want to get down here, if you remember, because we hold our accumulators somewhere around 400 PSI, and then our system cascades down. So in order to do that, after extraction, we have to add a huge, huge amount of energy and we might drop it so that we can go uh, to a lower enthalpy line. But then we get over here and we can see that if we get over to about 440 kilojoules per kilogram, when we go through that depressurization and come down to where our collector pressure is, we're in uh, the vapor range. So we've gone directly from a supercritical phase along one enthalpy line down into a vapor zone, uh, which is the opposite of, say, when we're coming out of a gas cooler and it's 95 degrees outside and we want to be on this enthalpy line in refrigeration and come back down and get a good liquid fraction. So big difference between extraction and, and refrigeration. I think it's, it's interesting to see on this chart how those curves kind of flatten out as you move from the really low internal energy upwards of some, some really high internal energy over in this region. And what's really cool is they're starting to use supercritical CO2, or not starting, they have been for a long time, using supercritical CO2 as a power fluid to drive a turbine. And 
the reason that that works so well is because of the energy density and the very low viscosity of the fluid in this region. So you can get really high mass transfers with low friction losses compared to other fluids. And it's, again, a, another day, another conversation probably, but CO2 as a power fluid is, is a really cool system to, to look at. Yeah, I'm definitely going to investigate and learn a little bit more about that. But I like what you said earlier that the differences between that CO2 refrigeration, because this is what I talk about all the time, we're going coming out of the gas cooler, we want to get liquid into that flash tank receiver. So we have good quality liquid going out. But when we talk about extraction, we want the most kilojoules per kilogram. And it goes from that super critical, the, the density, I guess we want more density. So we go actually from that fluid supercritical state right down to the gas or the vapor phase. So that's, that's one thing that is, that really struck me one on our last conversation. Yeah. And this chart shows it really nicely now seeing those conversion points and where you want to be. So when we look at a, a process design, depending on our extraction pressure, we're going to set kind of a minimum inlet temperature to make sure we're not in this region where we start to get liquid build up in our cyclones because then we're going to be discharging liquid CO2 with the product that we're collecting and that creates dry ice which exists below or across the, the left side of that liquid line and then also below the triple point all the way down to minus 80 which is where we get sublimation and that's the dry ice converting directly to a vapor it boils I'm using my air finger quotes at around minus uh, 75, which what's makes it a great packing material for things like vaccines to pack with dry ice, because when it's boiling and releasing that or absorbing that huge amount of energy through phase change, comes at a low temperature and an ambient pressure. Yeah. And you can see that if you ever buy dry ice, you know, lots of people do it for like Halloween and stuff, you get some dry ice and you throw in some water and you get all this nice little smoke, but it's actually so cold. I think it's minus 109 Fahrenheit. I can't remember the exact number of the dry ice, but it's it just goes right from that solid to a vapor. In your systems, I'm assuming, have you caused dry ice or have you had that happen inside a system? And what was the process when that happened for you? And what did you do? It, you got below to triple point with liquid and caused dry ice in one of your extraction machines. Yeah, you can produce dry ice at higher pressures as well. And we definitely do produce it in some instances. When you depressurize liquid, so if we have a, a process that is, say, very temperature sensitive, we can flash that high pressure liquid to a two phase or even three phase flow where we have liquid, dry ice, and CO2 vapor discharging through our nozzle or, or our relief valve. And the downside of the, the positive side of that is it stays very cold. So if you have a very volatile molecule or something that is temperature sensitive to degradation, then that's a, a benefit. The, the downside is you can't collect it as easily because the dry ice will form almost like a puck in the bottom of the collection vessel and it doesn't like being discharged out of a, a nozzle. But there is another cool process talking about CO2 applications called dry ice blasting which is like sandblasting, but using pelletized dry ice. And then there's no residual sand on the product that you're cleaning, whether you're removing varnish or paint or in a medical application, they use it for cleaning implants sometimes to blast away oils and, and other surface contaminants where they don't want to use an abrasive or some other toxic chemical for cleaning. Wow. Interesting. I've never heard of that before. Always learn from you, James. I love it. The other thing we talked about was there's a lot of different grades of CO2. And what I always find interesting is that even within certain grades or specifications, like if we look at beverage and food, they have the same 0.9 and the same 0 0.01 of, of other gases. One of the differences being that beverage has low dissolved oxygen. So the, the quality of the CO2 for the application is always important. And I was curious how this compared to R744. And what Lindy promotes is the 9.99. But interesting here that the comment they have is a max of 10 ppm water. Water obviously freezes below zero uh, and it expands. 
So that's not a good thing to have in a refrigeration system. And it goes to show that maybe some other qualities of gases would also be suitable for use as a refrigerant, or they can probably be purified to that point. We were talking about the brewery recapture systems. CO2 is CO2. Most of the CO2 in North America is made from either burning methane or digestion. So say from alcohol production, the way that CO2 is then purified is much like the same process for purifying CO, uh, alcohol, which is distillation. So boil and recondense, boil and recondense. And the number of times you do that and where you uh, either use absorbents to remove undesirables like water, you could use emulsive or activated alumina, for example, volatiles, you could use carbon. CO2 can be purified to, I guess, the highest purity, regardless of what you start with, which was pretty interesting. I think at Atmo, when we heard there was a shortage of R744, I can't believe that would ever actually happen. <laughs> yeah, just so I'm clear. So most of the CO2 that, that we get is from like the alcohol industry. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Yeah, fermentation is, is a large production method for CO2. It doesn't necessarily need mean like the consumer alcohol industry, but like ethanol for fuels, for example, or other applications, large alcohol production uh, and methane production or sorry, methane burning are the two um, most common ones that I've heard of. So they take that CO2 and that would be like the, the first layer. Then from there, they will, they will process it a bit more, like they will purify it a bit more. And the more they purify, it's the higher grade of purity. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Much like you can triple distill your water, you can triple distill your CO2. And yeah, CO2 whatever, whether we exhale it or it comes from a yeast cell, starts at atmospheric pressure and probably 60 to 70 degrees. And then through compression and cooling, it's liquefied. And then once you're liquefied, you kind of go back and forth across the phase boundary and you can pour off the things that condensed with the CO2. And then you can purge the things that didn't condense with the CO2, much like they do in alcohol production. Okay, excellent. So because you do you work in the um, beverage industry, your, your equipment is in the because you did, I know you talked about hops extraction, and different extraction process. Is there a way that you can in a system create your own CO2? You would need a few more steps. But theoretically, yes, compost produces CO2. So if you're taking the raffinate from extraction, you could capture it, but um, where we're entering the CO2 purity industry is on the capture from fermentation side. So it's excellent for breweries who want CO2 independence, and we can purify that CO2 back up to a beverage grade through compression and distillation. And we use an R744 heat pump to support that process as well for the condensing and the reboiling. Because in the beverage industry, especially making beers and things like that, you need a lot of CO2. So you're saying in a system, you can actually produce the CO2 that they can use in their production? Yeah, exactly. So if a brewery right now is producing probably more CO2 than they actually need to recarbonate the beer and package it in a conventional. So in the big breweries, they're already capturing it and they're using you know, a large compressor and a cooler package. What we wanted to do is commoditize a product that can accommodate anyone who brews more than 10,000 hectoliters a year effectively. So, and, and this small machine can capture and liquefy up to about 250,000 kilograms of CO2 from the beer making process. Wow. Because that, that's huge for a brewery because I'm sure just because buying CO2, I've bought lots of CO2 in my, my, my day for my little setups and making beer, but that would save a huge amount of money in the long run. I'm uh, assuming that if you can produce 250,000, do you say 250,000 kilograms or pounds? Yep. Kilograms. kilograms. Yeah. So I, I think that would just really help the bottom line a huge amount. Plus if you have the equipment there, you don't have to call or wait. There's so many processes that I think it would reduce that. That is super cool. Something I did not know. Awesome. So 
one of the things that, yeah, we did talk about is the purity and lots of people ask, well, what if I run out of CO2? My supplier doesn't have CO2. What would you do if your supplier didn't have the grade you were looking for? Just say you were looking for research grade, or if you're looking for beverage grade and, but they only had bone dry or they had something less. Did you guys ever run across that or any of your customers ever run across that? And what would be the process for them to use other purity levels or can you? Yeah, in extraction, the system's very versatile. So it would depend mostly on the market. Bone dry is probably a a good replacement in an industrial application where you don't necessarily are concerned about any other contaminants that might not be food safe. Because in extraction for us, it's we're always adding contaminants into the CO2. We have additional dissolved oils. We have additional moisture entering the system. We have non-condensable gases entering the system uh, constantly. For refrigeration, I'm not exactly sure, but the water would probably be the biggest concern for freeze up in the system. Yeah, if I was in a jam and I put my red green engineering hat on, I'd a couple extra desiccant cartridges and a beverage grade uh, or higher CO2 gas supply probably yeah. be okay. Yeah, no. And that's, that's for sure. You got to, you need to get your customer up and running, use some filters, filter through it. Most of the manufacturers explain what they would like to see. Some manufacturers in their manuals will say, okay, use a filter after five bottles, change it on this size of filter because that's the process of it. And they don't use the same one for a thousand jugs or <laughs> cylinders of CO2, but there, there is a process to do it. And one thing you said there, James, is one thing that I've talked to a lot of refrigeration manufacturers about is that something they worry about. You need to really dehydrate the system. You need to get all the moisture out because in CO2 applications, there's a potential to freeze up. Even in regular synthetic refrigerants, you, you could cause freeze up, but it's not, something in CO2 is uh, something you got to watch out for. Dry systems mm-hmm. are so important in refrigeration. <laughs> Question that popped up here. How CO2 impact the automotive switching from R1234YF to CO2? I do not know the answer to that. I think it's happening though. I know BMW has switched over to R744. I know there's a couple of industrial truck brands that are using the benefits of R744. I hope it happens faster. Yeah. I, I think it's it's something that I've heard of happening for a while now. I don't know how mainstream it is yet, but there are some car manufacturers definitely using it. I don't know if they're fully doing their full fleets. Maybe they are. That's something interesting I can look up. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I can add something to that one regarding automotive in industry and cooling and heating and using CO2 as refrigerant. I guess what I was thinking about like how this, because now we're talking about EV and electric vehicles that that are coming and it's not only space heating and cooling that is going to be the need future. It's mostly also like how to cool or heat the battery in cold or hot season. So I guess in future, CO2 will probably be one of the fluid that we use to, uh, to manage thermal energy in everything, like either the, the EV system or even the in-building. So I guess that also is going to be a, a good application for CO2 since we know that CO2 requires probably very tiny pipes. And especially in cars, we don't have a lot of say, big space in like in the engine and in, in front or even in the in the cabin. So we want to make it as compact as possible and also to be able to do the the thermal management as efficient as possible and i guess co2 in that regard is going to be probably one of the best so in these vehicles it's going to be more like a heat pump instead of like a heating and an air ac system you're going to have more like a heat pump inside these vehicles i'm assuming yeah, because you, it's not only space heating and cooling, it's going to be also other needs for heating and cooling. And then imagine integrating everything into one system and it's becoming a sort of uh, energy recovery. Like it's your car is becoming like a factory that requires different needs in terms of heating and cooling. And then 
trying to link all that into one system and probably CO2 since it requires pretty small pipes would be the best. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And somebody in the chat said nowadays Euro is going to implement it by 2028. I'm assuming that's going to CO2 and vehicles. So there, there's lots of changes coming and this is, this is why I do this. So we start to learn, learn more. James, any final thoughts? Really appreciate you guys sharing some of those, that, those insights on uh, the pressure, temperature, enthalpy uh, diagrams. Yeah, CO2 is, like you said, it's going to be in a lot of things, not only refrigeration. So keep sharing the knowledge. Thank you for inviting us on again and look forward to meeting in person at the uh, next trade show. Yeah, for sure. Well, I love having conversations because you guys, you guys are involved in this all the time. And uh, I know there's more I want to dive in with Parham and his experience with the CO2 geothermal, the heat pumps he's been working on ground source heat pumps, because I think this is, this is something that we all, I, I want to learn more about because all that research you've been doing over the last 10 years in there, there's a lot of knowledge that you have that I, I'd love to, to learn from you. Parham, uh, any final thoughts? Thank you so much for inviting uh, us, uh, Trevor. Always uh, enjoy talking to you about CO2. And I see a, a great future for CO2. As I mentioned, it's not only about you know, refrigeration and heating or uh, cooling, space heating and cooling. I just see CO2 as a heat uh, carrier fluid to be able to transfer heat efficiently between different applications. So I guess CO2 in future will uh, like see more advancement in this particular, uh, like transferring uh, thermal energy between uh, different locations uh, using CO2. Hopefully soon we can have another session talking about, uh, as you mentioned, about uh, using CO2 as refrigerant in ground source heat pump or any other applications. Awesome. I, I like what you said there is the uh, heat carrying fluid. I'm going to use that. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, James, how can people get a hold of you, get a hold of your company, same with you, Parham, to find out more about Vitalis and what you guys do? We're online at uh, VitalisET for extraction technology.com. Happy to start a conversation on LinkedIn as well. So feel free to have me on LinkedIn. Awesome. I really appreciate your time. And once again, go and check out their website. Go and learn more about them. Go connect with them on LinkedIn. This is what it's all about. This is how you learn, you grow, you ask questions. These are the experts in the field. The only way you're going to learn things if you're going to ask questions. That's what you got to do. You got to ask questions, understand why, be curious. Like I say all the time, you got to be curious about what is going on in the industry because it is changing really fast. And and I really appreciate your time today. I really appreciate everybody listening. Those that are listening on the podcast, if you want to check out the visual visuals on the YouTube channel, go check that out as well, because this is going to help you grow. Share this knowledge as well. Everything that I share here, the experts come here and share each week. Please share with someone else. That is how you learn. I want to thank everyone for taking the time again, and I will see you at the next CO2 Monday. See you later, everyone. Hey, thank you for watching this video. I do hope it is bringing you a lot of value. If you are looking to grow and build your refrigeration teams and want them to learn CO2 refrigeration, head to the refrigerationmentor.com website, click the contact us, and let us know how we can build a culture around training inside your organization. Let's get a conversation going.